Um, so, my name is Stefan Maltana. I'm a researcher at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. And today I'm talking with Sinisa Malesevich, who is a professor at, at the University College in Dublin, Ireland. And Sinisa is, I would say, one of the academics in Europe who have published most extensively on the history and sociology of war and violence. And uh, Sinisa has been in touch with the Institute in Hamburg for some, some time now. We are currently uh, working together on uh, publishing a special issue on the dynamics of uh, violence, legitimacy and control in civil war. Today we talk about an article he has just published in the European Journal of Sociology with the title, Is it easy to kill in war? Emotions and violence in combat zones of Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina from 1991 to 1995. Sinisa, um, this article is part of a larger project. As I understand it, you're also working on a book manuscript based on this work. What are the issues that you explore in this book? Um, or maybe put differently, what is the puzzle that made you engage in this whole project in the first place? Thanks, Stefan, for inviting me and organizing this uh, uh, interview. As you mentioned, much of my work has really been more macro historical up to now. And the last two, the Sioji War and Violence and the Rise of Organized Brutality look at the kind of historical change of violence over long periods of time. And then I, I occasionally do obviously some micro sociological research, but I wanted to shift focus a little bit more in that direction of micro and meso, uh, meso level of violence. And uh, I was lucky to kind of be involved with this project uh, number of years ago now, I think nine years ago, when I started this, uh, these interviews with the former combatants in, in Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, and then kind of led me to think a little bit more about this, uh, you know, kind of what motivates people to join uh, armed organizations once they are on the battlefield, how they react, uh, you know, what are the kind of emotional uh, contexts that are generated by kind of experience, direct experience of violence, of killing and things like that. Uh, so so uh, now I'm working on a, on a book, as you mentioned, rightly provisionally called Why uh, Humans um, Fight the Social Dynamics of Close-Range Violence, where I look at, uh, uh, in, in theoretical terms, I look what we know from biology, uh, from neuroscience, from psychology, uh, from economics of violence, from politics of violence, all the way to sociology, to see really what are these motivations for for fighting, you know, which include obviously killing, but many other things. So it, it is a big topic, and and it, in some senses it, it looks ridiculous to, to ask these big questions. Uh, and then uh, half of the book is really using kind of uh, secondary uh, research, and the other half uh, is based on my own primary research, which this article is part of it. Um, in the article, you refer to dozens of interviews with former combatants, and this is exciting empirical research also because it provides such rich accounts of the experiences of ordinary soldiers. Um, what was your own experience in doing these interviews, um, and how difficult was it to gain access and have these conversations? It, it initially, it was quite difficult uh, for a number of reasons, because uh, I started off with, with official uh, veteran organizations, I've called them and sent them emails and it was kind of either they ignored me or there was a reluctance to do this or they would just give me the, the you know propaganda line of everything what is already in, in available so i had to do this informally through kind of networks of people that i know uh and through kind of these uh, uh once i do an interview with a few few people then they would recommend me to you know so sort of the, this chain referral type of a, of, of, a, of a sampling if we can call it that way uh, and, and then even when, when I was in position to interview them, there was still reluctance for different reasons. Among the Bosnian Serb soldiers, some were reluctant because I was based in Ireland and for them that's West and that's potentially danger because ICTY, uh, you know, courts, the cases were still happening at that time in Hague. Uh, and then there was also an element of a uh, me positioning myself because most of the people that I interviewed were more or less my age, some older, some younger. Uh, and then they wanted to know where was I during the war. <laughs> so in a sense, I had to kind of be very careful how, how to uh, present myself because I was interviewing both, uh, you know, uh, Bosnian Serbs and, and, and Croats. And, and I'm originally Bosnian Serb who studied in Croatia during the war, which is very strange and bizarre in some respects. <laughs> so, it's, it's a, so I had to kind of deal and navigate with, with this. But it worked okay. I think most, most situations it worked. 
there are obviously you know major ethical issues involved with this uh, that I had to, to deal with, and you know I've asked people you know if you, if you are not comfortable with this, don't you know respond. Because uh, they wanted to talk to somebody, most of the time their stories are not heard. You know, in, in that sense, some of them said that openly to me. Well, I haven't been you know talking to anybody for the past 10, 15 years about this, so I'm glad that I had this opportunity to talk to you. So, so there were I could say more uh, uh, external obstacles. Uh, then the, the ones that you, once you meet them and you, you spend time with them, uh, and then they do kind of these interviews have really had impact on me how I see the conflict in itself because it's one thing reading about conflicts and studying externally, doing archival studies, everything else, and and then talking intensively with people who went through these things. And I have to emphasize that uh, I did interviews only with people who did have a direct experience of battlefield. And in these interviews, um, what were the most surprising discoveries for you? Or what were the most important things that you learned about violence and war? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a few things which, which surprised me. Uh, first was this kind of sense of empathy that you can't across, uh, uh, you know, you would expect that people do show a lot of, you know, solidarity with people that they fought with, but there's a lot of empathy, uh, uh, you know, relating to the people that they fought against, which is really strange. Mm -hmm. And it was very much against these conventional narratives that, that are perpetuated. You know, this is a war fought between, you know, for Croatian thing, for Serbian thing, uh, or Bosnian thing. And then, uh, you know, you, you, you go and talk to these people and then they tell you, you know, I, I know that these, you know, the, on the other side, you know, they were in the same situation. You know, most of these were recruits. We have to bear in mind they were like late, late teens, early 20s, uh, and they were not particularly keen on being in, in that war in the first place. So, so their understanding is that people on the other side went through more or less the same experience. So there's that sense, okay, we both went through this, uh, you know, we know that we, we killed each other and fought with each other, but we do share that kind of, we don't want this to happen to anybody. So, which is a nice sort of very positive message, which you wouldn't expect ordinarily, especially because, you know, this is a still, even though war ended 25 years ago, you know, the tensions are still very much there and the new generations are now perhaps even more, uh, you know, dislike each other while this generation grew up together, more or less, you know, so they were part of the same state. So it's, so it's kind of, it shows this ambiguity, you know, that you wouldn't expect to find. So that's one thing which I found, which is really interesting. Another thing which I found uh, was kind of less uh, uh, significance of ideology of these kind of big ideological themes that are present in the media and the official narratives. And their focus is much more on the, that sense of obligation they had towards their family and friends. When you ask them, why did you go? You know, somebody would say, okay, my, I, I, could, I didn't have to go. You know, I, I, was, I could just leave. I could go to Germany. Or my brother went to Canada and then I felt, you know, I had to do this for my family or for my friends from school or things like that. Uh, so that sense of attachment and responsibility towards family, friends, but also once you are there on the battlefield, you couldn't leave because now you're, there is that sense of attachment towards these comrades that you share something with them. We, we, this is not surprising so much. It's fairly common, but it's interesting to see it. <laughs> and the third thing is, is perhaps the most important for me is this uh, kind of whole dynamic of, of fighting and killing which, which is so complicated and, and so uh, diffuse and messy, uh, you know, from the narratives that you usually get about whether killing is easy, whether it's difficult. And, and I, I, I could see that this is really, you know, sociology is really needed in these kinds of analysis because you get these kind of biological explanations that are killing is very easy and simple and straightforward. It's about, you know, a fight or flight, or you get these kind of psychological, psychoanalytical explanations which focus on trauma and difficulty, and elements of that are present, That's but there's much more than that. So this kind of, uh, there is a wider range of experiences in relation to, uh, you know, violence and, and behavior of soldiers in, in, in the context of war. And I think what's really sociologically most important is that sense of uh, of variability that the same individual can in one situation say it was not difficult for me you know i i was cool as a cucumber as i mentioned in the article or you know I, when i was killing them it was like uh, you know bowling pins you know just shooting it, it they were not humans to me but then the same individual would say and then you know, on another occasion you know maybe a few months later i was crying after i've done this so, so it's the same individual reacts differently in different contexts and that's important, kind of this dynamic of, of violent experiences. It's not, it's a, it, it keeps changing constantly and trying to capture it, uh, you know, it's not easy.
in that sense. Um, one could argue, of course, that uh, interviewing people decades after um, a war does not provide any valuable insights into the actual experience at the time itself. So what is your take on this? What, is, uh, what was your own impression on how people remember and relive experiences during these conversations? That's a very good question. In a sense, I think time lag is always involved. Unless you do really interview uh, immediately <laughs> during the fighting, you know, there is always uh, after. Uh, and, and soldiers themselves, uh, or combatants in any situation, it doesn't have to be war, keep reflecting on that experience. Initially, before the battle, obviously, there is an element of fear and, you know, uh, anticipation what's going to happen. Once you are in the battle, you just do things what you do. Uh, and then after the battle, you re reflect on it. But then you change, you reflect again, you know, a few days later, you reflect, and then a few months and a few years. So it's an ongoing process of kind of rethinking what happened to me, uh, you know, and, and kind of positioning these emotional and cognitive uh, uh, experiences into, into some sort of a broader narrative. Uh, so, so I think we do that all as human beings. <laughs> Can we reflect on past and, and provide some sort of a narrative packages into what happened? But what's different here, and I think what's important in this article, uh, is you know emotions are very different from kind of our cognitive understanding of what happened. We change information. We we we, we build information around in, into these narratives that are provided to us, and that feel us comfortable. You know, help us feel comfortable. But in this, with emotions, there, you know, it's it's emotions leave leave kind of deep deep scars on 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 our psyche in a sense, and you remember really well what happened. You know, if somebody died next to you, or if if somebody was injured, or you actually had killed somebody, these things have a deep emotional resonance. So in that sense, I think uh, reflecting on them is slightly different, and you wouldn't you know kind of re reconstruct this whole narrative in a very different way. 15 years later or 20 years later, because you know, exactly, you know, and they would tell, tell me this, you know, okay, this is what happened to me. And I've asked them, you know, can you, you know, now differentiate how you felt at that moment and how you feel felt, you know, a few years later or now, and they did, they were able to do that. So, so I think there is a great value in, in getting this kind of information, this kind of research. Obviously, people do keep re reinterpreting things and framing them this way or the other, but I think emotions can be captured much better than cognitions, I think, in that sense. I would like to pick up on this aspect of emotions, because in the article, mm -hmm. you focus um, on the emotional dynamics of violence. So why is this such an important aspect? And why did you choose mm -hmm. to focus on this? Yeah, so, so I think that's also very important. Uh, in, in, in the study, obviously, we do have a sociology of emotions as, as a big field developing and expanding. But emotions have still been kind of very much dominated by biological interpretations or you know, particular interpretation that is influenced by kind of neo Darwinian a tradition, which sees emotions as, as fairly fixed and stable uh, and universal in that sense. So we have now, you know, I, I think uh, kind of good, very good sociological research coming from Randall Collins and others has questioned the kind of some aspects of this, this understanding, but not, not completely. I don't think that it, it goes far enough because if you look at, at, at Collins, he still uh, is very much linked and clings to, with this kind of traditional understanding of emotional fingerprinting, that you can read emotions from faces of people. Uh, and this is a Paul Ekman's idea, <laughs> which dominated psychology for many, many years uh, uh, from 60s onwards where they, where they you know, say there are six, only six emotions, six basic emotions, uh, uh, fear, anger, disgust, surprise, sadness, and, and happiness. And you can read them from faces. And they did research all over the world trying to show emotional fingerprinting is embedded in our bodies and, and it doesn't change. It's always the same. So now we have this in, in, in neuropsychology, more recent, Michelle Barrett and others, who questioned this. He said, this is not the case. You know, and they, they've done a lot of experimental research, which points out the emotions, you cannot capture emotions. What you can capture is some sort of vague, positive or negative uh, imaging. Uh, rather, you know, so, so they talk more about kind of emotional bundles. So emotion in that sense really is, 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 is more like an umbrella term that captures so many different things, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly where one emotion starts when, one, when the other ends. So, so I build on this kind of tradition, more recent tradition, and question and push it a little bit further because they are psychologists, so they're really interested in the individual. And for me, what's interesting is how emotional dynamic develops in, in a social context. And that's why I think killing and fighting is really good 
good uh, example of this to look at the, the way how people, uh, you know, reshaped that whole experience. Uh, and, and it's not, you know, that's the whole point that emotions are not triggered. You don't come to the battlefield with prepackaged emotions. You know, we are not kind of developed emotional creatures and you just go there and then something is triggered. No, actually emotions are created in that social context on, on the battlefield, after the battlefield, when you talk to people and share these things and, and then years later as well. So that's the key point. Uh, you know, we do understand that as sociologists, it's not easy for us to accept that emotions are socially constructed, but to, this goes a little bit further. It challenges this kind of, uh, you know, bi biological understanding because obviously emotions are produced by, bo by body. There is that physiological element, but you know, the, the focus here is that social is so, so powerful, much more powerful than we would traditionally think it is. So we, we have these two uh, understandings that uh, either killing is easy, so you know it doesn't really involve any emotional costs, if you like, or if it does, you, you deal with them quickly, or it's profoundly difficult, and once you do it, that's it. You know, it, it, it tears you apart uh, emotionally and morally in every other sense. And then here we see that you know vari variation is present, and the same person can do uh, you know the same uh, uh, in the same situation can act very differently. So I think the point is that we don't really know, we cannot predict emotional reactions for individual, on the individual level, even more so on the collective level. So, so I'm not saying that, you know, there's nothing universal and then, you know, every experience is unique. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there is obviously a lot of universal things, but they are not biologically predetermined. They are not prepackaged. They are shaped by specific social context, by historical context, and what people bring with them to the battlefield. So, so I think that kind of challenging the whole emotional thing and, and some forms of sociology of emotions, which is too, too much embedded in this kind of biological tradition. I think we still need to uh, unpack this more, uh, you know, in, in, in that sense than it, it has uh, been. So, so I think this notion of emotional bundles is good. You know, <laughs> it, it, it points out that this is not fixed because it's hard for us to kind of, how do you differentiate fear from, from uh, uh, you know, anger or, Sometimes it's both, you know, it's, you know, we, these are labels that you impose and say, okay, we know fear is very different from happiness, <laughs> but something in between, there's wide range of things which are very similar and it's not easy to cut them out. Sinisa, one final question. What are the um, issues or the questions that came out of this research that you think we need to explore further? I think what, what this type of research shows is that really how important is ethnography in interviews? In doing this kind of micro micro level uh, uh, work on violence, I mean we are used to now, you know, obviously relying uh, if we do historical research on archives and all that, which is all good and, and useful, or we do uh, kind of consult these large N type of studies on war, which have dominated the field for for many years, and they're useful, they're good, and kind of especially this kind of macro comparative type of work to, to say what's happening with war in the long term, although I'm skeptical even in that respect. But if you really want to, to get the, this nitty gritty of, of violent experiences, none of these methodologies are useful. Really, you have to talk to people, you have to do ethnography, you have to do observation, you have to do any of these kind of uh, uh, qualitative sociological research methods to, to capture this. And, and there's so much of it. You know, I, I've read, and you've read many of these things, and, and there's never enough in a sense, because you always have feeling, okay, we can do so much more there. We can, we can probe this further. And, and I think, you know, the, 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 for me, you know, kind of the whole this uh, area of emotions is, is really interesting, really important. And what I, what I think is worth now uh, uh, exploring is this link with, with, the, with the organizational level. You know, how uh, military organizations use this emotional dynamic, or whether they use it, or whether it, it can explode for them. And, and one of the papers I read a, a few years ago, using uh, some of these interviews, was looking at the relationship between uh, Croatian uh, uh, military and Bosnian Serb military, uh, why one won and one other lost. Because if you look at the beginning of the war, you know, Yugoslavia was, had an enormous military uh, repertoire, you know, large army at that time, you know, considered to be fourth largest military in Europe. Uh, uh, and then you, you have a Croatian army, small, you know, it, it started from nothing. Uh, and, and then if you look at the level of, of emotional attachment and, and solidarity, uh, both armies uh, early on were fairly similar. And then you see how organizational discipline collapses in the Boston Serb army. There's a discontent between, you know, micro level solidarity and this organizational hierarchy because these were professional former JNA officers and there was no interaction between any Croatian case much more 
more glue, if you like, social glue. <laughs> and that impacted in part. Obviously, that's not the only reason why the Croatian army expanded and much, became much more powerful in that sense. And, and the Bosnian Serb army essentially disintegrated. Uh, so, so for me, it's interesting to look at this emotional dynamic and how it links with the wider organizational context of you know, organizational hierarchies and division of labor and all these things, work that you do as well. So, <laughs> so that would be the next level, I think. <laughs> Sinita, thank you so much for your time. It was a real pleasure having you. Looking forward to talking more about your, your research in the future. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs>